Hi guys, so it's car booty time again. This seems to be getting to be a regular thing on Sundays at the moment. A lot of you guys do seem to enjoy this, so let's carry on. This is, well, it's broken, that's what this thing is. Yeah, it's broken. And straight away I can say this is an AT machine. This has the power turbo HD LEDs. That's a physical on off switch. Okay. And looking at the back, we have some ports up here, so AT keyboard, no ATX IO shield, a graphics card of some sort. So, the question is, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Recently, I've been finding quite a few 486s, not huge numbers, but I am finding them. If this was something like a Visa Local Buzz machine, I would expect the graphics card to be down here, and they are quite rare. I mean, I actually had one last week. That's only the second one I found that worked. I have a third one with a lot of corrosion that doesn't work. Could be a PCI card. This could be an ISA machine. It's very difficult to say. I'm going to guess that this is a 486. We were using 80 cases like this around sort of 90. 94 that sort of time so yeah that's my guess but what do you guys think yeah what do you think it is okay so you have a few seconds to uh, get your guesses in yeah get to the comments down there put like you you know the point in the video I'm, I'm how many minutes where we are yeah and what your guess is and you know this is not so much a matter of like getting it right all the time although it's nice to get it right it's just about fun really okay so let's have a look inside the machine so we can kind of do this together i can't actually see what this is either i can see the back of the motherboard looks like it could be a 486 to me yeah look at the number pins there okay what have we got well, we've got a 486 with a PCI graphics card. That's exactly what we've got. But there's no processor in it. Unless, <laughs> unless the processor is stuck to the heatsink. <laughs> it actually is there. One or two pins a little bit bent. So let's have a look at that. Let's get this motherboard out and let's see if we can do anything with this one. Okay, so here's the motherboard. ALI, I'm not sure if there's any model number on this, there usually isn't with these 486 boards to be honest. Just the V1.2. But this is not like the one I had last week that had the Visa Local Buzz as well as the PCI. Okay. There's a, well, that's like the wrong size, shall we say, for the socket. But it's probably the correct chip. I mean, this will be the cache memory. It looks like there was space to double the amount of cache memory. And then this chip, as we remember, it's like the cache table or something. It holds the address or something like that in cache memory to, in, yeah, like an index chip, I think, for the cache memory. I mean, that's going back a long time to remember that. So you guys, yeah, sure, you can tell me and tell everybody else. The processor actually is not in bad condition. I mean, considering this thing was just like lying in the bottom of the case with the heat sink still attached, I'm not sure if there was ever a fan on this. Okay. I didn't see one inside the case. Well, not attached to the AT power supply that would clip on this anyway. There's a bent pin there, just the one from what I can see. So let's just uh, straighten this up and then see if this will fit into the socket. Okay, so that's uh, pretty straight. Okay. All right, does that fit in okay? Of course with these things you could kind of put them in in more than one direction you know they would go in different 
ways I remember, but there's like a little dot thing here in the little arrow with a chamfered edge there, and I'm sure that's how they lined up. I see now there's actually another bent pin. But it's not like you couldn't put the processor in the wrong way around. I think you just basically left it up to you to not be so stupid as to do that, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Something just off. Yeah, I've got it. It's in. So, process it in. Yeah. Let's see if we can get this thing to boot up and we'll find out what that is. Other than that, this looks pretty good. Uh, this was like in the day before VRMs. You might have had like a voltage regulator somewhere. But the processors ran on higher voltages back in those days. Okay. CR2032, nice, because these things don't tend to leak. And then we have the graphics card. Diamond Stealth, yeah, Diamond Stealth. I also have a Visa Local Buzz, one of these in my stash of the working machine. It's in bits at the moment, I could build it up. This was back in the day when you could just add more memory yourself. I mean, why they stopped doing that, I don't know, because it seemed to me like a pretty damn good idea, yeah, but obviously they did. Stop, yeah, 1995, Stealth SE. Was the SC like a kind of like a lower power, shall we say, version or lower performance? I can't really remember that. S3-3032, okay. PCI card, a little bit grubby. I'll just give that a bit of a clean, actually. These pins, you see just a little bit of a mess on them. Yeah, that's just a little bit of ISO. I mean, we could use like the end of a pencil with a rubber. This actually works very well also for cleaning these things normally. Okay. I'll just clean that one with the eraser again. Sorry, with the rubber, that's what we called them when we were at school. It's a rubber, don't care what anybody else says, it's a rubber. Okay, so, yeah, there we go. Right, let's see if this thing has any life in it. And we are ready to go. I'll just set the monitor to VGA. There we go. Known good AT power supply. What does this do? Well, it boots. Yeah. Another one that boots. Now it's making some bloops out, but we have a blue light and we have a picture. So, 8 meg of RAM. I'll have to get a keyboard and then we can get into the BIOS. Yeah. F1. And we're back to this sort of AMI BIOS screen. We've seen this before, guys, yeah. Right, so we'll go with the BIOS defaults. Now, I don't have a hard drive with this, to be honest, so I'm not sure this is actually going to do a lot, to be honest, but um, yeah, we can uh, at least set the BIOS defaults first. Uh, we'll go to the optimal settings. Yeah. And then we'll just save that. Right, what's it going to do? Well, it's a 486DX4. I can see that. And obviously, there is nothing for it to boot from, okay? But this motherboard appears to be working just fine. Another one. It seems a little bit surprising to me how many of these things I'm actually finding these days, these 
type of 486 and AT machines. I mean, you guys, if you're regular viewers, will know that over the last couple of years, I found lots of these things, especially like the early Pentium machines, Pentium 1, if you like. So, another working one and clean. I don't know if it's just something about my location here on the Canary Islands, Grand Canaria, why I find so many of these. They hardly seem to be scarce, and yet, looking at the collector's market, they are quite scarce. There's a good demand for these, and there's less supply. So, yeah, guys, yeah, get in there. Is it also something to do with our dry climate, why these are generally in such good condition when I find them? Apart from, obviously, the blue Volta batteries, which are weak. Uh, well, I'm not sure what the reason is. So, yeah, what do you think? It's also the case that I don't like go down to the car boot sale early. So, the sale starts at 8 a.m. I don't turn up till at least 9 these days and just quite often have a, a drink at the cafe first and then look around. And yet, there's not a problem with getting these things. It's not like I'm having to fight to get them. That's another thing. Okay, so... I got the heat sink off, it came off quite easily. I think I can see straight away this is an AMD processor, not Intel. Yeah, definitely AMD and definitely upside down. And definitely a DX4100. Okay. There. Microsoft Windows compatible, yeah. This is saying heatsink and fan required, which makes me think probably this did have a fan. Let me have a look again at the cables inside that case in case the fan is kind of attached to the AT power supply somewhere. Nope, definitely is not in there. And I'm of the opinion that this would have like a little plastic clip thing over it, which had the fan on, okay? So that's what we've got. Let's see if we have any money's worth. So, these old AT machines, I'm now paying 20 euros each for them. I was paying 15, but the guy said they were getting harder to get. I'm not sure about that. I think he's decided he can make a bit more profit out of me. But 20 euros is okay. It's not too bad, yeah. I'm not sure if I'll find this exact motherboard. I'll have a look. And... The graphics card, well, we know the model of that, so we probably will find that one. Well, there's the Diamond Stealth SE, the same I have, PCI, S3 3032. So, we can see the asking price of these cards. A couple there are a little bit cheaper. I'm not sure how that compares to the sold price. If we go to advanced on the right underneath me, sold listings. Yeah, I often find this. So, one sold there for like £16. That's the other one I have, by the way. That one, yeah. Another one for 12 That one sold for 30 So, is that a different one? Yeah, it's a different card. So, looking at the sold listings, they're about £12, £15, something like that, in actual fact. Regards to the motherboard, I can't find one exactly like mine. But it seems to be worth somewhere in the region of like about 40 or 50 pounds, up to about 100 pounds. Very hard to tell, to be quite honest. Unless one of you guys knows a little bit better than me, but it's going to be somewhere in that region, according to this anyway. And these are actually sold listings, okay? So, nothing much to do with that one, apart from just look at this nice old hardware. Let's look at something else. So, this is clearly a lot newer, this one. ATX machine. Yeah. A couple of USBs down there on the front. This has six USBs. It also has an onboard LAN, plus a separate LAN card. Graphics card in there. I don't think this is a date stamp or anything like that, okay. So it doesn't really tell us very much. This just says workshop, by the way. Tire, Spanish, yeah, tires. 
tire workshop oh. mechanic yeah so this is going to be something like well i'm going to hope it's going to be another pentium 4 four seven eight if i really wanted to hope the graphics card would be something interesting but hey that doesn't happen so often as you know that's why when it does they are interesting yeah so we can get the side off my guess this is a pentium 4 not quite sure why it has this connected to the parallel port i guess i'll probably have to take this off so i can get the motherboard out actually yeah that so it's attached to the parallel port and it just appears to be well a male to female yeah oh oh this is a, a dongle or something if it is first time i've seen one well we can look at that in a minute but first of all let's see what we've got so what do you think guys get down there what's the time in the video now you tell me when you're guessing what is your guess okay i'm gonna say hopefully this is gonna be socket 478 pension 4 with agp and it looks like that's what it is so it definitely has agp small graphics card then i don't think it's anything exciting oh we've seen this board i must have three or four of these now i've had quite a few of these seems to be really common pension for motherboard that one hard drives in it so maybe we can see what is on here if it works okay i'll get this one apart and let's have a look to see what we have in this little stash first thing we can say about this then is we have bad capacitors this one and most of these i'd say all of these yeah even that one's bulge so these are on the v core supply to the processor i think about 1.7 volts or something on these as i think i've measured them before there's something like that so we're gonna have to change those otherwise This looks okay. This is a CNR, Communication Network Riser. I've honestly never found a card that plugs into them. Both SATA and IDE. So apart from the bad capacitors, it's probably okay, this one. These are 1500 6.3s. I'm pretty sure I have those. I'll have a look get them changed or something similar anyway yeah i have a whole bag full of them here and the remains of the previous bag so yeah plenty of those that's not a problem graphics card just a small one what does it say on it vuvez or i whatever that's supposed to say which way up it goes zarpa <laughs> Yeah, whatever way that goes up, that's what it says. Nothing much else on this. Okay. 94V0. This is a fire safety rating, by the way. It means it won't set on fire. Pretty much like a flammability rating. So that's what the graphics card is. <laughs> AGP does say something 305 2m 32m i don't think it's of any interest particularly but we'll have a look just to see what that actually is okay and this is the dongle so a3 software atr3s we could look that up and see what that actually is <laughs> So the idea of this thing was like an anti-piracy device whereby you have to have this connected to the parallel port for the software to run. I've never opened one of these up or even been inclined to do so. In fact, I can't say I've really found one before, not recently at least. So there's something in here that the software reads. Now, whether it's doing something simple like measuring resistances or whether there's some sort of chip in here and it sends like a, a random key and then this decrypts the key and sends the decrypted answer back and if that 
matches what he expects and he knows he's attached i don't know could be interesting actually to get inside that and figure out how to open it up and yeah see what's actually inside it okay but first of all let's change these capacitors and then let's see if the motherboard works very easy to do this i've done it many times before on video but some of you guys seem to find it therapeutic or something so why not let's do it i could add a bit of flux but because i'm going to use the vacuum desoldering tool it tends to coil it up a little bit i'll probably just do it without so just get a bit of solder on there plenty of it actually grab the capacitor tilt it one way warm the other way tilt it the other way the thing with this is just giving this a second or so so you know the other one solidifies before you tilt it back otherwise you push it back into the board we can see the white on this one goes to the bit not filled in so the filled in part is the positive this varies from board to board you really need to just make a note of that or check yeah uh -huh. you'll soon know if you've got it wrong by the way when you fit the replacements and you uh, try to power it up yeah uh -huh. you'll soon know about it but it's better to know about it first yeah believe me not so, like that i've ever done that <laughs> okay somebody commented a long time ago that removing electrolytic capacitors like this you are likely to pull the via out of the board which goes through i have to say that has never happened to me or not as i can ever remember this always works just fine it could be something to do with this big chunky tip that i'm using getting plenty of heat in there you can see these by the way even the back side of it is kind of like bulged outwards yeah so that's them then there was one more somewhere yeah over here so You see, I'm doing this without removing the processor and heat sink this time. I could remove it, but because they're not too close, it's not too difficult. I may have to remove the heat sink when I come to clearing the holes in the board. Let's have a look. This one doesn't want to be soldered so easily, so we get a bit more solder on it. Okay. Try again. I'm in the right. Um. Actually, guys, I'm in the wrong place, and that's why it doesn't want to move. Yeah, the capacitor's actually here. Yeah, now it's moving easily. Normally that doesn't happen. Normally you're very good at judging with your fingers from one side of the board to the other where you are behind. That's made a bit of a mess, so just uh, tidy that up a little bit. Okay. Better. Right, so we got the vacuum desoldering tool. Okay. <laughs> It's pulling air nicely. I'll get the hot air as well. It helps a lot with this. So, hot air in the left hand, some right handed. Warm it a bit. Guys, this is not a race yet. I mean, this is just a bit of a comment to some other soldier I was on another video. This is not a race. This is a matter of doing the job properly. Okay, because that's come nice and clean. I'll do a couple or three, then I'll actually put the cleaning needle through the desoldering gun. There. Mm. 
just make sure this is still clear yeah it's fine go again I'll turn this around actually easy getting with the hot air I'll actually come right handy with the hot air this time just because of the position of the board Slipped that time, it moved. You see, I'm better with my other hand. If it doesn't desolder like that last one, just get a bit of fresh solder on it. Okay. And this one. Right, I'm going to come in left handed again with the hot air. You can see I work better this way around. Okay. Okay. I think they're all clean, let's have a look. Yeah, they look good. And this one also definitely looks good, yeah? Okay, let's replace the caps. Soldering the new ones is much easier than cleaning the holes. I mean, removing the old ones is easy enough. It's just getting the holes clean afterwards. It can be tricky. Well, if you do it that way, then, well, you've just seen how easy it was. Without the hot air, often you can't get enough heat in to actually clean the solder from the hole properly. Sometimes I would use the desoldering tool and then if it doesn't work properly I come back with hot air but I've kind of learned that you may as well just use the hot air anyway and then you don't have the problem most of the time. What is important by the way Is that you clean the desoldering gun before you put it away okay so when you're finished make sure this is clean pull some air through it and then the next time you need it it will be just ready to go yeah you won't be spending 10 minutes trying to clear the thing yeah believe me guys it will happen if you don't clean it through I mean, it's fair enough if you're in a workshop with a few other people because you can blame somebody else for not cleaning it yeah, and you can curse them while you were doing it, but... <laughs> yeah. Enough said on that, I think. Okay. You notice I didn't, didn't have to remove this heat sink. It didn't cause a problem, even though I'm reasonably close. Again, the hot air was helping a lot there. Oops, blob. Okay. A bit of flux will just help you to clean that up actually. If you do that sort of thing. I mean, it happens, yeah. It happens. You could use a bit of braid, but you'll probably find that a bit of flux and it'll just clean up. Like that. This board's still fairly warm, that's helping with the soldering. If you're having trouble getting the solder to take, just warm it back up a little bit. Again, it won't do any harm. A little bit of ISO then, just to clean that up. 
This sort of flux doesn't really cause a problem if you don't clean this off as far as I can tell. But it just looks a bit messy. Yeah, so let's do a nice job of it. Bear in mind, once you do this with the isopropyl alcohol, all you're really doing is spreading the flux. So you're actually just diluting it and spreading it all around that area. You won't see it so much then. But really, your eyes just clean it off afterwards. Yeah. Oh! Somebody said to me, cut my fingernails. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I'm asking the question, why? One thing I find if I cut my fingernails short, I find it difficult to pick up small components. It's better to have some, yeah, but I mean, the question is, if whoever was suggested that is, why? What problem are they causing, yeah? If they get too long, they will start to break, and then usually I do just cut them a bit shorter, yeah? Okay, so there's our motherboard recapped. Let's connect this up. Yeah, let's see if it works. I will just check the 12 volts for short. Having bad capacitors like that sometimes does blow the MOSFETs. So this is no doubt a good time to test for this. This is where you may find a problem. Of course, I should have done this before I changed the capacitors, before somebody mentions you're right. Should have done it first. Yeah, so this is ground. No, that's the actual uh, resistance on the VRM. This side is ground. Uh, resistance on the VRM. Okay, so that's okay. Bad English, that, yeah? Okay, it's okay. <laughs> Done it twice now. So, power switch. Guessing it's there. It's actually as marked, I think. This is where you normally find this. There. Okay. We'll soon see. Speaker. May as well. Analyzer card, of course. Uh, uh, we'll take the RAM off. Let's just go with no RAM. See if it bleeps. There's the analyzer card. Right. Power on. Nothing happens. Oh, switch the mains on. Now something happens. Bleeping like there's no RAM, yeah. Bleeping like there's no RAM. That could well be the case. Okay, let's get the rest of the dust off it at least, right. Give it some RAM. What's it doing now? It's starting by itself. This is generally because the CMOS battery is bad. Behaves differently. I don't think that's going to boot. I'll put the graphics card in. More likely I'll need to clean the RAM or the RAM slots on this one, but let's have a look. So on again. I think this D4, D5 is often a RAM problem. Not that the RAM isn't in, that's usually C0 or C1. D4 or D5 appears to be when there's a problem with the RAM, so it knows it's there, but it doesn't work properly. Okay. Yeah, it's got it this time. I just reseated it. I still don't have any thing on the monitor. Oh. Well, if I switch my monitor to VGA, I might get something. Okay, let's show you guys. No, in actual fact, I don't have anything on the monitor. Just try resetting this graphics card, otherwise I'll try another one. I don't think it was actually in properly, anyway. Let's go again. Yeah, blue lights on this time. Okay, so, 
Pentium 4 1.7, not worth anything the processor wise. Let's get the hard drive and keyboard buttons like this one's gonna work. Okay, ready to go. Oh! Something went bang. Huh! What was that? What on earth was that? Sorry guys, I didn't have it on the uh, screen. I didn't see anything, I just heard it. Well, the only thing I did was connect the hard drive. I mean, there could be a short one, I guess. Nothing else I changed. I can't see what it was. I'm not sure if it was in the power supply or the board, to be honest. So let me just uh, try it again. Let's see if it happens again. You never know, you look. Well, it's now booting up. Yeah. What on earth? I don't, I don't get that, guys. Yeah. It's booting up, but I don't get a picture anymore. Okay. And it stops at that point. I have no idea. Don't see anything on here. Uh, don't see anything visible. I'm just tapping. What the How happened? You guys heard it, I'm sure you heard it. I heard it. Uh, power again. Bleep bleep. No picture anymore. My monitor is still working by the way. Wow. Let me try a different graphics card. Okay, another one. Okay. Power on. Doesn't like that graphics card. It stopped there. I'm sure this is a good one. Okay. Interesting. This is another one, I'm sure is a known good one. Okay. That one it seems to like. And we have a picture, I'll just show you. And the boy. Yeah, you can see it there, we have a picture. Let me put the other one back in, the one that was in the original. I'll just uh, move that out of the way a bit so we can still see it. All right, we can still actually see it. Now then. This is the original one. Okay, just uh, power it on again, right. No, that is booting and going to give us a picture. Guys, I have no idea what went crack unless it was something on the hard drive. Yeah, something blown on the hard drive, maybe. Let me just check for shorts on here. That might make some sense that something went crack on the hard drive. Okay. Let's have a look. Just on ohms range, so from ground, check from the 5 volt and the 12 volt. Well, that's got a short on it. You see it there, guys? 
to short on the hard drive. Yeah. Yep, you got it. Mystery solved though, so there's a short on the hard drive, that's why it went bang. That's what I heard. Can we see what it was? Well, it looks like that's what it is. So this actually is a protection device, a bit like a Zenith diode, but not quite a Zenith diode, but it's basically protected against over voltage. So if there's too much voltage on here, then this often goes short. There's another one there. So generally there'll be one on the five volts and one on the 12 volts. This looks like it's on the 12 volts, which is here. Let's have a look. It looks like it goes to here. Yeah, and ground. This is on the 12 volt rail, so I don't understand why that would blow, to be quite honest. I mean, if there was something important on here, if we unsolder this, the drive might actually work. I mean, there's nothing I want on this. I've actually taken the rubber sleeve off it now so I can get to this. But I will show you that's probably what the fault is. I've seen this happen normally with defective ATX power supplies and quite often if you even remove that the thing will work. Okay, you can see I've just taken these off the board, basically. I've lifted these up now. Yeah. Let's see if we still have a short. You can hear the meter. You don't need to see it. You can hear it. So, this end goes to ground. There's no longer a short. That goes to there. We can just connect this back on and just see whether this actually powers up now. Just out of interest, really. If it doesn't, I'm not too bothered. If it does, well, you've learnt something, maybe. So, let's try that. You can see the monitor there. Yeah, you can see the board and the uh, hard drive. Yeah. Let's see what this actually does now. So, we'll put the power on. Nothing went bang this time. I don't have the analyzer card in because I know this thing is booting anyway. So we're going to the uh, uh, BIOS, I think. Let's put the screen a bit bigger so you can see it. Well, it's booting XP. <laughs> so there you go, guys. If the hard drive goes bang, check for these. These are called. TVS diodes on the input. I have no idea why that one blew because normally these will blow when there's too much voltage. It's on the 12 volt rail, so it's not like I could put the connector in the wrong way round for any reason. If the 5 volts went on there, the 12 volts went to the 5 volts, the other one would have blown. Okay, so are you a victim of uh, software piracy? Resolve later. And we're on. Uh, I'm not sure if this thing was the thing that you needs the dongle. Advanced system protector? No, I don't think so. I don't see anything else down here particularly. Softcast, whatever that is. Uh, what's this thing do? Advanced system protector. Seems to be, yeah, it's just registry cleaner and that sort of thing, maybe antivirus. Okay, guys, so that one is working. Something that's interesting towards the end there. I hope you enjoyed that car booty, and there'll be some more next week on Learn Electronics Repair. Ciao for now, guys.